Jeff is getting tired of telling you how good the War for the Tower podcast is, so he'd like me to tell you about his other podcasts, all of which are members of the Sinister Parent Company Network. Good Idea is an improvised think tank that takes half-baked ideas and turns them into genius. Everything is Awesome is an in-depth interview show about independent art, good writing, and social issues. Something Wonderful Right Away is a hilarious long-form improv show. And Shattered Worlds RPG is a space opera actual play podcast that uses the RPG system that Jeff created. Check out all these shows and more on the Sinister Parent Company Twitter feed, at Sin Parent Co. Thank you again to Jeff for sponsoring this episode. And now, on with the show. This is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Unspoiled, covering Doctor Who, Season 5, Episode 13, The Big Bang. In this episode, everything works out, and our friends are going back on an adventure again. One of them in a wedding dress. Again. We keep having women in wedding dresses running off. Welcome. To unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I am Jamie. At least she didn't run off in a wedding dress without her husband. I mean, that's true. She does run after the doctor saying that we haven't even gotten a chance to snog in the bushes yet. I don't know what her problem is. I really want to know, guys, what everybody says to make this okay. Because I've been saying Rory deserves better. And Rory waits for her for 2,000 years for her to immediately ditch him to try and make out with the doctor. So, if anyone would care to present some evidence to dispute my claim that Rory deserves better, I'm interested to hear it. Nobody? I, 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 don't, I don't have a defense of her. I don't know what her fucking problem is. Like... Is I, the thing is, I have a feeling I can hear people out there being like, it's just a joke at this point. No, no, no. You don't joke about some shit that you did, though. That's the thing. She did try to fuck the doctor the evening before she was supposed to get married. Mm-hmm. Rory knows that. So you don't joke about a thing That your significant other would understandably feel really weird about and, like, self-conscious about and concerned about. That's not a joke. You know? So Agreed. That's not my, I don't want to, like, that's not my takeaway from this whole episode. I'm not trying to, like, harp on it as a means to ruin everything else that works out. But I got to admit, it came as a shock. When she just keeps saying it, like at first when she says something like you could, you for one can definitely kiss the bride. I was willing to be like, oh, Amy, but then she keeps doing it. One time is a joke. Two times is a pattern. What the fuck is wrong with you? Is this a Stephen Moffat doesn't know how to write women problem? Maybe. I I really would like to know what he intended by doing this. Because I think he thinks his, he's very cheeky. I he guess. thinks he's very clever. Like, it's just, it's so awkward. It's awkward. Like, it's the kind of thing that feels like when you have a couple of friends who had, like, a, a, an argument and one of them is trying to pretend that argument never happened. And the other one is obviously still really upset about it. And you have to sort of also behave as if it never happened until one of your friends clues you in that either they have an understanding 
or that they are indeed upset, but they're trying to like buy their time before they bring it up. I just don't really feel like I know how to act. And I don't, I thought that we were done with this when she remembered Rory and her like Mm -hmm. memory kind of restored him to being. I thought that we really had turned a corner here and this was a new Amy who appreciated him and realized everything that he had done. And it seems like that's what I meant to think about Amy from the way that she like watches the footage about these, the uh, centurion who guarded the box throughout the ages. I feel like they want me to see her as appreciating him and being very touched. But then she just does. And it's like, it's on their wedding day. And her memory is back. So it's not like, oh, she's just doing the thing that she did because she doesn't remember that we did this. But she does remember. She remembers everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't I don't get it. I really don't. It just makes Amy seem really disrespectful. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and she's gotten past that by losing Rory and getting him back. I really felt like there wasn't so much of that like dismissiveness of him the mm-hmm, way there had mm-hmm. been when she thought maybe there was something better out there. Right. You know, like it took him dying for her to realize, no, there isn't better. Rory is the best. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this just felt like like that behavior was written before the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's not agreed. cute. It's not it's as just, cute it's as confusing. Stephen Moffat thinks it is. Yeah. I it, like it, like you said it's disrespectful, it's weird and like considering everything like all of the devotion that we see from Rory, it's kind of humiliating also. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, I don't really get what they were trying to do there. So, I don't like, you know, like I said, this isn't my full takeaway of the episode. I'm not trying to just harp on this one thing. But I just really was affected by her remembering Rory last episode. It made me cry. And I feel kind of ripped off that I didn't really see a payoff, like in terms of her behavior after that, because I really thought that was the moment where she understood how important he was to her. And then to like see that, Maybe she does and she just doesn't know how to express it, but like, get over it. You're an adult. Figure it out. Um, I just feel like bummed out because I got my hopes up a little bit as to this being more of a love story than that worked for me. And I don't feel like I got that and I don't really understand what I got instead. So I think that's really what it is, is that I was so affected by the previous episode and the way that went that it feels even stranger to take it Mm -hmm. in that direction at this point. Um, I honestly feel like it's supposed to be, it's not supposed to be something that we are supposed to really focus on. mm -hmm. Like we're supposed to think it's just Amy being silly. She's just being Amy when really we know where her heart is. And she's just playing around. But when you really think about it, it just feels out of character. Mm -hmm. There are times when she's written as a character that I have always had issues with. Mm -hmm. Um, Amy is, to most, I feel, most Doctor Who fans, their favorite companion. Hmm. And... um, I always had I always found her to be a little bratty. Yeah. And that hasn't gone away on this rewatch, although I do like her more than I used to. But it's these little moments that's what makes me feel that way. She's a little I'm bratty. Genuinely surprised to hear that she's a lot of people's favorite companion. She's a Wendella lot of people's exists. favorite. Like <laughs> I really question everyone's judgment. If you if Amy is your favorite Granted, we have not reached the end of the Amy arc, right? 
there's clearly like more to come. Mm-hmm. They're still on the TARDIS. Maybe I will begin to get it. But as of right now, I don't see it for Amy at all. And I don't really understand. Like, I'm not trying to just make her weird attraction to the doctor her only personality characteristic. Like, that's not the thing. Mm -hmm. But I have to be honest. I don't I don't connect with her almost at all. Like. She's funny sometimes. Mostly she yells doctor mm-hmm. and those that's her function is to be that's funny in that you peril say that. somehow. When she was tweeting along with Vincent and the doctor, she was kind of making fun of herself for oh there it is. There's my catchphrase. Doctor. Yeah, Which I like loved. Yeah, I mean, I'm not mad about that because that's like, unfortunately, the role that many women are relegated to in stories where a man is like the focus. If you listen, I think I mentioned like Indiana Jones and this one woman saying Indy like 7,000 times throughout the course. Is of it movie. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? Because no. Yes. Oh, really? The, oh, it's yeah, Raiders, it's, isn't it? It's Raiders. Which is unfortunate Indiana because Jones, she's otherwise Doom, such a great she, character. Yeah, she is great. The Kate Capshaw character, I when I watched that as an adult, I was like, man, she just screams a lot. Right, yeah, totally. So, you know, I'm not trying I'm not blaming her for that, but I just don't feel like I get who she is. I don't know anything about what she likes and doesn't like. All I know mm-hmm. is that she's kind of like a party girl, is the sense I get. But even that is just based on her wanting to go to like Rio. And wearing, like, fishnets with shorts. So what you're saying is you have a pretty good intention or impression of who the doctor is, obviously. Mm Mm-hmm. Pretty good idea of who Rory is. Definitely. Despite him only being in a few episodes. But we've had 13 episodes with Amy. And you're not quite sure who she is. Yeah. Yeah. And there is the crux of one of my biggest problems with the way Stephen Moffat writes women. Mm-hmm. She's a yeah. major character. She's I don't just know. Kind you're of right. There as like a plot device. Every time we need something, yeah. she's she's the a one girl with a mystery. But it's not really and like it's not about her as a person. I don't understand anything. About, like I said, it just feels like the default joke with her is that she wants to do whatever sort of like. The party thing to do. But that's kind of it. And yeah, well, the whole point of Amy in this entire season has been what's the deal with these cracks in her wall? Why are they following her around? Mm -hmm. So there's a mystery around a girl. If we look at the other two major episodes Three, I guess, if you want to consider Forest of the Dead and Science in the Library. But that's not quite as much in that, in those. But if you look at Blink and you look at The Girl in the Fireplace, there's a girl and mm-hmm. there's something happening around her. There's a mystery. Something weird is going on around this girl. Right. And that's what Stephen Moffat does on this series. So far is there's a girl who's interesting, seemingly definitely. I would have loved to get more of Sally Sparrow or more of Lady de Pompadour. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, intriguing characters, but I don't know that much, maybe more about Sally Sparrow than I even know. No, I don't. It's a mystery girl. Like, J.J. Abrams has his mystery boxes. Every show he does, every movie he does, everything's a mystery box. And Stephen Moffat has mystery girls. And I think that's why, I think that's one of the problems that I had with Amy myself, is I find her bratty, and I don't find a lot of substance. And I want there to be, because I love Rory, and I love the Doctor, and I think Karen Gillan is incredible. 
So I need more Mm -hmm. from my companion on this show. Yeah, I don't really like I feel bad about it because I don't want to feel this way. Right. You know? It's not your it, fault. It, it's 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 not her fault. It's the way she's written. And yeah. I can't give you any kind of spoilers moving forward. All I can say is that hopefully that will change because you would think now that this mystery, the cracks in the walls, the cracks following her through time have stopped, mm-hmm. that we have to dig a little deeper into Amy as a person. Right. Mm. River is also a mystery, I'd like to point out. Yes. And like River, I'm willing to sort of let that go because it feels like that's like going to be explored. Like we're not meant to know yet. But I feel right. like with Amy, I am meant to know and I don't. No, I know. I'm not saying not to compare them. Just River's another character right, that Stephen Moffat right. created. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like... It feels like, because, you know, we're saying that she seems disrespectful with the way that she is with Rory, which I maintain. Mm -hmm. But there's also a sense of, like, they don't respect her either, the writers. And Mm. that feels more and more true. She's Um, not given a, a ton of agency. Yeah. Everything sort of happens to her. Yeah. But I don't ever really, like... The only time that I I can think of off the top of my head, and I'm sure that there's other examples and I'm just not really like thinking about them right now, but off the top of my head, the only time that we've really seen her like take charge in a situation independent of the doctor is when she gets captured and she breaks out of there with the uh, underground dudes. Hmm. She didn't do that on her own. No, she like break, she breaks out of like the little dearly by herself because she like uh lifts the key off of the guy who's mm-hmm. about to true. fucking yeah, cut her true. up <laughs> but she doesn't actually manage to escape completely alone she gets out of that situation and gets some like mm-hmm. intelligence from peering around other than that i'm trying to i'm trying to think of a time where she kind of like took charge and i can't think of is there something that i'm forget i'm sure there's something that i'm forgetting there was the moment um, on the space whale where she used the information she had learned about the doctor who she really just met mm. to get him to change his mind about what he was doing. But what was it that she changed his mind on? He was going to kill the whale. And oh, she got right. him to change okay. his mind about that. So... But that's not even really agency per se. Mm -hmm. And mostly, trying to think of vampires in Venice. Um, she kind of got herself out of that. No, Rory saved her. She she was bitten. (sighs) Rory saved her. She yeah, she's basically been damseled a lot. This season? Yeah. Um, and like I said, I'm sure there are people listening to this who are like yelling right now because they can. Oh, think I'm of sure. <laughs> and please, I feel free to like give me an example because I, this is the kind of thing that I like Loki want to be proven wrong about. I don't like coming across this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does feel like she's an afterthought. A lot of the time, like she's just a, like I said, a plot device. She is a character Mm -hmm. put in place to do things that need doing, but not necessarily because she is the kind of person who would do that. It's not character driven. And I don't know. It just sort of bums me out. I just want, I want her to be doing like, I want the, the, plot to move forward because it's inevitable that Amy would act this way in this situation, Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't feel like I know enough about her to ever say that. 
that she's it's, just this is just what Amy's like and what she would do, you know. It's like the common complaint that a lot of us had about Game of Thrones that in the later seasons these characters were making choices that did not follow their development up to that point. They were mm-hmm. being completely out of character. They were making decisions to move the plot instead of making decisions that those people would make. Right. And it was so infuriating because we'd spent so much time learning who they are mm-hmm. and what motivates them. And all of a sudden, it was all out the window because we were in a mad dash for the finale. Right. And for me... I can forgive a lot in a plot if the characters are acting the way they should be mm-hmm. in their situations. Mm-hmm. I care more about character than I do about plot. I think mm-hmm. it's a reason, one of the reasons that for me, I love Lost and I can forgive things that bother people because the characters are what I was there for. Mm-hmm. I don't, I give a fuck about the mysteries on that show. I don't, I honestly, overall, don't care. All I cared about were those people because they were so well drawn. And that's what frustrated me personally with Game of Thrones more than, you know, lots of things frustrated me. But that was one of my main gripes was like, this is not the way these people would act. Mm -hmm. And I feel that way a lot of times with this show that like the doctor is always consistent. He's weird and he makes weird decisions, but it all fits Mm -hmm. in what we know about him. It's really hard to know what Amy would do or wouldn't do Mm -hmm. because there's not – she's a very pretty shell and we need to know more about her. And the most I could relate to her was when Rory died. Yeah. And there was this real – emotion or even in Vincent and the doctor, I like her quite a bit because Mm -hmm. that felt real. She cared about something. Yeah. There was a personality there that was beyond whatever was going on with the doctor. And we don't have enough of that in this season to really understand why Amy would say these things at her fucking wedding. Mm -hmm. And the, I think it boils down to, they probably don't know why either. They, Moffat just thought it would be cute. Thought it would be chuckle. People would laugh at her. Look at Amy Which back is, to her old devices. Why does he think that people would find it cute? Do you pe- like honestly guys, are you are I you listening know. to this and you're just like, <laughs> why are they so annoyed about this? It was funny, who cares? Because if that's the case, I would like to hear from you just out of pure curiosity because to me that's like really gross. I yeah. can't imagine saying that kind of thing, like, in front of Owen. I mean... No! That's, you know, the whole thing about the the way that she was with Rory and her saying, like, how could I ever forget you? And it just feels like that all got flushed right down the toilet. Um, at their wedding. At their wedding. Like... They're already married. And I know that they think it's cute... And I actually don't have a problem with them saying, no, it, you're Rory Pond now. Mm-hmm. You're yeah, not, that was fine. She's not, yes. she's not Amy Williams, you're Rory Pond. But there's a part of me that feels like that was Stephen Moffat further sort of emasculating Rory. Mm-hmm. Even though that's not how I personally see that situation. I don't. We've talked about this like when we've talked. Right. Not about shows. Like I, I don't. I think it's stupid that women have to take the man's name. Why can't the man take the woman's name? Who cares? It's just a mm-hmm. name. So, like in that respect, I don't have a problem with it. But I think his reason for writing that was to take Rory down a little bit, and mm-hmm. I don't like that aspect of how they write about Rory. Yeah, it seems like rather than treating the fact that Rory was like watching over her and devoted to her as like a true love thing, it's more being made into like, look at this fucking sad sack. Who the yeah, Rory, is, the man who waited. Yeah, you know, it just there I thought it was beautiful and yeah. touching. And then you have this like 
joke made out of it that yeah really says more about the people who see it as a joke than it does about Rory. Yeah. And uh, cuz we know, know why cuz Rory has been Rory has been written consistently enough that we understand he fucking loves her. Mm-hmm. He loves her more than anything and he would do anything for her including waiting the doctor 2000 in the face. Yes. That's the test like, the doctor sets up is whether or not this is really Rory by how much he's willing to do to save his girlfriend. Right. But I guess that's just a sign that you're pussy whipped. I don't know. Because to me, <sighs> we all should want a man like Rory Williams. Rory Williams is perfect. Yeah, he's he's wonderful. Boy. He's one of my favorite characters on this show and when people ask me who my favorite companions are rory is always on the list i couldn't say that before because you didn't know he's a companion but he is and he's one of my favorites because he's incredible he's so devoted and i love that about him and it doesn't make him weak and i think they want to make the audience think it does that devotion makes him strong so we'll see how this leads into the next season because it really the characterization can only go up yeah that's hope. true hopefully I just really want like really what I I'll talk about what I don't want I don't want any more of a companion lusting after the doctor ever uh, again. Agreed. I didn't want that starting with Martha. Right. Like when we had that with, with, I keep wanting to just say Billy Piper. Rose. Rose. Thank you. When we had that with Rose, it felt really special. Mm-hmm. And now that they're trying to do that with literally every companion, it just cheapens it so much. Mm-hmm. And like, you can have hints of that. You can have like the companion occasionally kind of looking at the doctor and being like, Oh, actually, Hey, what's up? You can have moments of them being like, you know, my, my significant other can be a real drag about things. And I wish that there were times he would be a little bit more like you. You can have moments of them appreciating things without it being like, I'm going to pine away endlessly and basically settle Because I know I can't have you, so I'll have, like, the next best thing. Or this, which is, I've got a dude who follows me around and worships me, whom I occasionally deign to notice, but mostly I still want to bang you. Which is just really sad. Mm -hmm. And I just don't, I don't, uh, honestly, the main thing for me being, why does everybody want, like, sure, The doctor is a unique being Mm -hmm. with abilities and knowledge and power that are not to be seen anywhere else in the universe. Granted, but he's a dickhead, guys. (laughs) He's a douche. He is arrogant and incredibly self-absorbed and (laughs) really vain in this way that like is just and (laughs) and. And oddly, like, lacking in empathy, despite the fact that he's, like, there to, like, stick up for people, allegedly. It doesn't feel like he really gets it a lot of the time. I genuinely do not understand what it is that... It, it's it's the paradox of, like, the fucking dudes in... <laughs> Like when you watch an old James Bond film and these women are throwing themselves at him and James Bond, like, let's all be honest. A lot of times he weren't hot, man. There were occasional Sean Connery, James Bonds that were all right. We've got T. Daltz, who we all know I like, but (laughs) then there's that other one who like, uh... (laughs) oh, Roger Moore, who had one movie. He was not handsome. He, that was not a good looking man. But he's the guy. So Timothy, no, what's his name? Um, Pierce Brosnan. He's handsome. Never he's did it handsome. For me. 
He's got a rabbit face. He, he never did it for me either, but I can look at him and go, okay. I can, it's, I get it. It just and I kind of feel the like, same way about Daniel Craig, where I'm like, sure. I how get it, dare I guess. you, ma'am? <laughs> he's, he's not... I, he doesn't do it for me. I think I he's a great even. actor. I love him in Knives Out, but oh he God, doesn't... Knives Out with that fucking accent. <laughs> uh, he, he's handsome, a for sure. I hole in a donut's hole, but instead this donut <laughs> hole has its own hole in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> what in the fuck that script is so good um but yeah it just this just feels like the the thing that we do white male protagonists are the main characters and they must be the guy who gets the girl always mm. And that is how we are in, and this feels like a real holdover from an old show in that regard. Mm-hmm. This feels ancient because we just keep doing this and there's no reason for it. Like there's just, I am not convinced by what I see that there's anything that would really make these women drop their panties the way they do. Donna is by far the most relatable with her just being like, oh, it, <laughs> ugh, no, uh-uh. Thank you. Put your shirt on. Like, <laughs> thank you, Donna. <laughs> Fuck. So, anyway, we haven't even talked about this episode like at all. Nope. And it's an actually all pretty fun episode the because there's a lot of like weird time stuff. Like, for example, we've got like baby Amy drink trying to drink a soda and somebody just yanks it out of her hand. <laughs> and you're just like, what? And then later he has a soda and I was like, oh, those little things are very fun. So I don't want to be so mad. But, don't you be know, mad. Characters come before plot, so that's sort of why I started with that. Yeah. Don't be mad. Don't be mad. I feel like that could really be the fucking tagline to unspoiled <laughs> Doctor Who: is you just telling me don't be mad? <laughs> there's there's a postcard. <laughs> yeah, unspoiled you know Doctor what? Who yeah, should be it. Don't be mad, and then my, attribute it to me. <laughs> Man. Um, but yeah, so this episode starts off, it's actually a pretty fun thing where they're like, show, they're looking at a painting that baby Amy drew, painted. And yeah. they're like, girl, what is this? And I'm like, what do you mean, what is this? What the, what's y'all's problem? And then it's it the turns stars. out that like stars don't exist. Yeah. And they're just like, bitch, do you see the sky? Do you see a star? No. What is this? Stars are to, a myth. To which I like hugely want to be like, hi, your child has some imagination. How about you just be cool? But, right. They took her to, her aunt took her to a, a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. And the psychiatrist is like, let's go outside. Let me show you, child. All that's in the sky is the moon. I mean, Stars don't exist. That's a fairy tale. Like, just like she's a seven. Bit overkill. Am I wrong? Do you know that yeah. we were supposed to write these stories when we, I was in first grade? We were meant to like write a little um, short story. And since then, I've heard that this has actually been a pretty popular children's book. But I was in first grade. I don't think this was a thing then. And I wrote a story about this girl trying to uh, bake a birthday cake and. She added too much of whatever and the cake grew so big that it took the roof off the house and they needed a ladder to climb up and put the birthday candles on. And I wrote this in first grade and my feedback from my teacher was not very realistic. See. What? Yeah. And I think about that sometimes. Like what kind of cold, dead hearted old cunt. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, um, I'm sorry, first grader, but I was really hoping for something a little bit more grounded and gave me a fucking C. But no, you should write that story now. I like I said, I think that it is a like a, a story that has been written. I have seen people like talk about something that sounds very like that. Well, so I'm James sure it's the giant done. peach. What? The only thing I can think of is James and the giant peach. 
This is a big I, I, food item. It was a short story. It wasn't like a book based on what I'm like an illustrated children's book, you know, mm-hmm. is the, what the what I've heard. But yeah, it's just like trying to take the kids at therapy for this. I mean, I think that there's also meant to be like her talking about her imaginary friend, I guess. Yeah, that that's why year. she's in therapy. But it just but she does didn't feel have, like in the moment that's like, all it is. And you're just like, guys, chill out a little. In this universe, though, this version of Amy, who never met the doctor, doesn't have an imaginary friend. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I she guess keeps, that's true. She keeps drawing these pictures and talking about things like stars. And her aunt is like, you need therapy. Those don't exist. And like, well, no, she's seven and she's creative. Right. Like, yeah, I unicorns just, don't guys, exist either, but that never stopped people from writing about them. And it doesn't stop you from decorating a whole little girl's bedroom with it. Right. But Mermaids don't exist either. How dare you? Again. You should see my hair. My hair is very mermaidy now. <laughs> I, I dyed it the other Owen day. It's a great color. He he has a couple of nieces that I was sitting with them when they were talking about the Harry Potter movies and they were like really agitated at how wrong Harry Potter got mermaids and how <laughs> they don't look like that. And Those why aren't did they mermaids. Make Those them are mer like people. That? Well, don't don't try and get in this argument with these girls because they are passionate and they feel a way about how things are supposed to look. And they got real, like, irate about it. And it was actually really funny. But they, you know, 100% believe mermaids exist. This was an argument based in what they believe is the fact of how mermaids look. Okay. And they are not in therapy because that's an insane (laughs) thing to do. But anyway, so somebody puts a pamphlet through her front door. About the Pandorica, um, which is on display at this museum. And mm-hmm. she manages to convince what I guess is her aunt in yeah. this universe. Uh, yeah, that's who her. she. Mm-hmm. That's who. What's that? That's who she. That's who she lives with. Okay. Um, like it's revealed later. She doesn't remember why her parents are gone. And the indication is that her parents were taken in by the crack in the wall. Right. And I think I said something at one point, like, do we know what happened to her parents? Yeah, we didn't. I think I asked you about that. And you were like, we don't. And I just kind of let it go. I don't think I thought any more about it. Um, I also really like that they have the fez on the doctor to really, like, give us an indicator of when we are. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a clever thing to do because he doesn't wear that at other points. So it's a very, like, specific device to give us an idea of which doctor we're talking to right now, you know? And also, when we see him sort of slink by wearing a fez through the door there, we've Mm -hmm. never seen him in one before. So we might assume it's a doctor, but we don't know. Right. Yeah, so she gets this thing. She goes to the display. It's sitting there with, like this whole timeline around it and the Pandorica throughout history, yada, yada. People have tried to open it and we wind up finding out about the, uh, the Centurion later, but she Mm -hmm. goes to this museum and she winds up doing a uh, mixed up files of Miss Basilie Frankweiler hiding in the museum and coming back at night kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Did you read those? No, you didn't read the mixed up files. Uh, they hide out in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, like, sleep in, is it Queen Elizabeth's bed? There's some, like, historical bed on display and they sleep in that at night and stuff. Um, live on the food from the uh, the snack bar. It's pretty fun. Hmm. But, yeah, she walks up to this thing. Somebody grabs her soda out of her hand as she's about to drink it. When she turns around, there's nobody there. And she turns back around and there is a post-it note that says, stick around pond. Can I tell you how many times I had to rewind to figure out what the fuck that said? I got (laughs) stick around, but that does not look like pond. I needed reminding later. 
that that was because I kind of like I read it and I was like pommel, Powell, paw, <laughs> and I kept being like you know what I'll find I'll find out later and I like let it go, and then it was like. You know, once they kept talking about her last name being Pond, I was like, that's what it said. Why didn't he just call her Amy, though? But, yeah. Um, because he says, come along, Pond. Um, that's what he writes on the pamphlet. But that's also something that he has said to her before. Come along, Pond. Is it? hmm Oh, I don't remember that. Okay. So, her aunt's looking for her. And they're – honestly, it's kind of amusing to me that, like, basically, it just comes down to, well, I guess she didn't find her. I guess her aunt well, just goes home thinking that Amelia's I thought of that too. I thought of that, too. But then later we learn that they're kind of in the eye of the storm of the universe disappearing. Mm-hmm. And – all of a sudden, everybody from the museum is gone as well. And what I assumed was her her aunt kind of disappeared with everyone oh, else. Oh, I thought it was just the museum emptying out because it was the end of the day. Well, is there's that. Is that supposed to be? But, there's, but it's also, he says, like, if, when little Amy disappears later, he's like, she's gone. She doesn't exist. Because oh, everybody's... okay, I was not getting that right then. Okay, I got you. Yeah, because at first I was like, so how could her how could her aunt just be like, well, she'll show up, I'll right. just go home. Until I like paid more attention to what he was saying later, and I was like, oh, she probably just raptured out. <laughs> what a weird thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense. It's just such a, like, they have it gradually getting darker they have like people just like just sort of finding their way out and then we have like please report to reception so it sounded like it was sort of the end of the day and they were doing their like well we gave it some time she still hasn't turned up i guess we'll do an announcement that thing that kids do when they get lost in the uh grocery store Mm -hmm. did you do that no i 100 percent did that one time no, but because when I was like five, four or five, um, you know that guy who does the uh, America's Most Wanted TV show? No, I don't think I've ever seen that. Okay, well, his son, when I was little, four or five years old, was abducted from a department store, like a Sears or something in Miami. Hmm. And that's where we lived. And... That happened like a couple of days after my dad had taken me to that same Sears oh, shit. and lost track of me. And so after that happened, it was drilled into my head from both of my parents that I do not leave their sight because right. somebody could snatch me. So, yeah, I never did that because I was always terrified I was going to be kidnapped. Well, that'll do it. <laughs> shit. <laughs> Yeah, my dad said he, like, when he realized, when he put together, like, oh, my God, we were just yeah. there. It He, like, lost his mind and was like, I'll never take my eyes off of you ever again. Aw, Dad. I'm surprised he didn't put me on a leash. I was also a very obedient kid. Like, if my parents said, like, no, you're not going off by yourself. You're going to stay right here. I, I hated getting in trouble. So I was like, okay, same. fine. Same. Very much same. I don't know how parents deal with kids who just think nothing of what their parents just told them to do. I don't either. Cause that was not an option for me. Like I just for my own like, personality, but like my mother, I threw a fit in a grocery store once and my mom was like, all right, we're going home. And mm-hmm. we left. She, and she, I was so embarrassed that my mom had to take me home because I wasn't behaving. Yeah. I remember the one time that I was act, and I don't even, I think I was just whiny. I don't remember. I don't think I did anything wrong. I think I was just being a fucking pain like kids can be. And I was at the aquarium or something. And my mom like yanked me into the bathroom and she did that like not yell that moms do where they're like hissing and they're not like really raising their voice, but that makes it scarier. 
Yep. And she was like, if you don't get yourself under control, we are going home right now. And I was just like, oh, God. And that was just like, <laughs> that was enough. I was like, all right, yep. fine. Um, but that was, yeah, I was not really somebody that parents needed to say things to twice most of the time. Yeah, I was either. definitely, though, a lawyer about it. Like, I would loophole <laughs> shit and be like, well, you didn't say this. And I never, I never was brave enough. I, okay, I just do what I'm told. I'm still that way, though. I'm, okay, that you need that done? Fine, I'll get it done. If a <laughs> boss tells me I need to do something, even if I don't want to, even if it's stupid, I'm going to do it. I'm a rule follower. <laughs> I can't help it. I love the idea of me. you saying that, though, like to your body being like, all right, I'll do it. Even if it's stupid, because you told me <laughs> to. I may think no, it's I, idiotic, I, a terrible I idea, but I'll do my, it because I that say is that to my what I do. friends, not my <laughs> boss. I send text messages to one of my fellow managers, and I'm like, "Are you, do you have to do this? It's so stupid. <laughs> oh, oh, we'll okay. just get it done. <laughs> Um, so she sticks around. We see her like walk past like some petrified uh, Daleks and whatnot. Yeah. And she comes across the spooky box um, and she puts her hand on it and it's like that awakens it somehow. Mm-hmm. We find out it's like her DNA is being like mm-hmm. replicated. Because it's. Because it's Amy inside of there. Right. But she's so, not alive entirely. She's like in stasis in there. Yeah. But as soon as younger Amy touches it, it's it knows it's the DNA of the person inside. So it like gives it mm-hmm. permission. Under normal circumstances, if the doctor was the one stuck in there, that's it. It's so shocking no- that Rory is able to open it. But I guess With he uses his, the uh, screwdriver. Screwdriver, yeah. Yeah. But, like, if if the doctor hadn't done all of this f- time folding in on itself back and forth in his own timeline thing, mm-hmm. the doctor would have just been stuck in there forever. The reason it works for Amy is because it's Amy in there and it's Amy outside of it. Just a younger version of Amy. Same DNA, though. Right. It's a pretty good moment. Mm-hmm. You know, I forgot like about it and that. I watched this episode a few months ago and still when it opened I was thinking it was going to be the doctor and then it opened and it was Amy and I was like oh right <laughs> God how'd <laughs> they do funny. that again <laughs> yeah I am um, I'm a fan of not only the fact that she's the one in there but her first line being like okay kid this is where it gets complicated yeah, I just really like that line. I think that's a good one. Um, and I think that's a nice little like wink to the audience of just being like, ha ha, didn't see this coming, did you? I did not. Have, sir. Yeah, you are Have fun trying to unravel this one, audience. Yeah, I'm here for it. I like it. So, OK. Uh, we go to credits after this and then we go to Rory cradling Amy's dead body looking very sad little plastic man and the doctor pops up wearing a fez carrying a mop Mm -hmm. being inexplicable as he is (laughs) yes making no sense it's okay she's not dead I mean she is but she's not I mean she is for you, but for me, she's not. Very helpful, oh. sir. Thank you. That clears <laughs> it all up. You jag. Um, so, yeah, I really, I really, this was a great way to start things off. It got me very engaged right away. The doctor gives him the screwdriver, disappears, comes back, is like, oh, by the way, when you're done with it, please put the screwdriver in her front pocket. Which, uh, you know, we wind up getting to see from the other side all of that Mm -hmm. a little bit later and him, like, realizing what he needs to make happen. And, you know, it's really having this, like, time trap. What's it called again that he's got? The vortex manipulator. 
yeah. It is a bit of a deus ex machina. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not a bit of it. It's that's what it is. But I'm right, really because, not that mad because about it doesn't it, have the know? TARDIS. Yeah. Right. Um. And Rory goes and gets him out, and I love his like puzzlement as he's seeing Rory holding his uh his screwdriver while he has his and has them like touched together to make sure that they are legit that they are the same item not mm-hmm. just a copy um and then we see him walking around through these like weird petrified versions of his enemies that are sitting mm-hmm. there so we've got like uh one of the centurions with his hands up we've got the daleks We've got a couple other. You'd think there would be more in here, but yeah, because it was very crowded. I don't know if they just like if there was a different I think effect they, on them. Yeah, I don't know why certain ones sort of petrified and everybody else just winked out of existence. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. But. In any case, this is like the progress of the universe collapsing in on itself. So it's, this is not an instantaneous thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rory, meanwhile, is asking the doctor what exactly he is. And the doctor tells him you're a lump of plastic with delusions of humanity. To which I say, um, ouch, sir. <laughs> There's no need to be so honest. Please. <laughs> it just feels so, like, mean. And, and I know it's true. I mean, sure, fine. But there's, it's just, you know what I mean? Ugh. Yeah. It's harsh. That's a harsh thing to say. You, you're you a lump of plastic with delusion. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> shaken by it honestly later when rory offers to stay and the doctor's like stay away from fire (laughs) i mean to be fair he tells him to stay away from stuff that like honestly most human beings should also stay away from right but it will melt you (laughs) but yeah it's just so like sort of the instructions on the back of like a care you know, like the care instructions <laughs> on like a piece of polyester fabric. Um, but anyway, so this, I just really enjoy the scenes of just Rory and the doctor together. The two mm-hmm. of them have such a strange relationship mm-hmm. and such totally different approaches in personality to literally everything that it's always very amusing The doctor says to him at one point, do you have to be so human? And really, that's the the whole reason that Rory and the doctor are so good together is because Mm -hmm. he is so human. And you need a little bit of relief from the doctor's alienness every now and then, you know? Yeah. Um, And he's not enamored by the doctor. mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. he's not afraid to like speak to reason yes whereas you know that's why donna was so great Mm -hmm. these other companions just sort of are like oh he's so he knows what he's doing i'll just whatever the doctor says i'm not going to question it right yeah and it's like i mean he does know what he's doing to a degree it's not like that is completely an unwarranted position but it's their their adoration overtakes any like reasonable questions about the situation that they might have, and then there's yeah. someone like Donna or someone like Rory that's like, "Hold on a second, because mm-hmm. this is insane." So let's take a let's take a beat, and what are you talking about? Yeah, please explain. Yeah, so let me see Donna. Jumping up out of the old, Donna. Uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> See, this is me talking about 
people who speak up to the fucking doctor and then getting my wishful think on. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, Amy comes out of the box. She uh, plays with her younger self's hair in this moment that feels very, like, human to me as well. Like, if you came across your younger self, I don't feel like you'd really be able to resist touching your younger self to be like, oh, my God, this is what my I like how was she. Like? This is what my face was like. I like how she tries to figure out when it is by little Amelia's height. Right. Yes. Oh, you're, She's 1996. You're this tall. <laughs> like, I wouldn't know how looking if I came across a younger version of me. I'd have a more of an indication of what year it was based on what my hair looked like than how tall I was. For sure. Because I have no idea how tall I was back then. I was little. I'm trying to think what my markers would be. It would probably be how many teeth I had. <laughs> and because I lost my two front teeth at the same time. And that was like right around when I was like, I think, seven years old um and probably my hair because i just had a, a straight up afro for the first <laughs> while i had it for a while um and then eventually i started to like let it grow out i just didn't like my mom fucking brushing it like it mm. was straight hair straight yeah. hair and curly hair do not brush the same way but she did not know how to deal with curly hair and so i was subjected to fucking torture while she tried to feel her way through it and it just nobody was happy about it it didn't go well for anybody it was a bad scene did you just get like big tangles i mean big knots my mom would call my hair the rat's nest. <laughs> she would be like, all right, sit down. We got to deal with the rat's nest. And yeah, just, I mean, even now I have these like giant matted dreadlocks at the base of my neck. If I've been, if I've been wearing my hair down and like I wore something with like a turtleneck or a high collar in the back. Mm -hmm. From just the action of turning my head to look at things all day, by the end of the day, that collar will have rubbed against the back of my neck and formed this chunk of 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 uh, fur ball, essentially. <laughs> so that, like, and I know now what you have to do is get in the shower, soak it with conditioner, and very patiently. Un, like comb it out tease it apart but mm -hmm. my mother would sit me down with my dry head and get a fucking bristly hairbrush and Ugh. it was just the worst it, and my whole head would be sore <sighs> guys my boyfriend gets those dreadlocks too I mean because he's got really curly hair it's awful you know it's not like I don't enjoy this, but I can't help it. Yeah. And she just did not know what to do. She did not know how to cope. Um, but anyway, this is not the Natasha's hair cast, although I could do that for sure at some point. Um, That's a future unsober. Mm. So this is when we see the Pandorica through the ages and we uh, get like a cut between of Rory arguing with the doctor and saying that he needs to guard her and her finding out about this centurion that saved the box from a fire. Mm -hmm. And you see this illustration of the uh, supposed, you know, it's, it's the artist's interpretation of how it all went down. I always enjoy that kind of thing um, of just like, well, you know, if it were to have happened, this is what it may have looked like. Right. And there are reports of people doctor. having seen this centurion pulling this box out of the fire mm -hmm. 
and then never seeing him again. So it's believed that he died in the fire. Right. And she knows he was plastic. So she thinks he melted. Which you would. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I kind of was like, if he died doing that, I was still going to be mad that Rory was dead. But I would have felt like that was a worthy death. You know, that was him like doing a, a duty of commitment and dedication for thousands of years and dying in a blaze of glory, as far as I was concerned. Mm-hmm. So, again, not to say that I wouldn't have been mad that he was dead, because I definitely still would. But I wouldn't feel like him dying previously because the doctor was just taking his goddamn time. That did not feel worthwhile to me. This was something that I could get on board with. But he is thankfully not dead and has decided to go undercover as a museum guard, which makes total sense and is precious. And he really (laughs) looks good in a museum guard outfit, I must say. Also, (laughs) he's adorable. He has a little bit of a new swagger, I would say. Yeah, he does well. a little bit, you know? He's been through it. Yeah. He's been through it, and also he realizes that, you know, I have a gun in my hand at all times, <laughs> which I'm sure probably helps with feeling a little yes. bit less, like, intimidated by people. I really love him going up against the uh, fucking Dalek. And the Dalek... What is it that it starts saying later when it's like regenerating? Is that the word it's saying? Revitalizing? I don't remember. Oh, I can't. It says something and it's it's like regenerating, regenerating, regenerating. It and then wouldn't it like be regenerating. Maybe it's restoring, but regeneration is Might a be. term really just for the doctor, so Whatever it is, time it's Lords. this noise that it yeah. does that it eventually just sort of like disappears into a high pitched like whine sound. And mm-hmm. uh, I found that really, really funny at the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, the him being alive still and being like a museum garden, it's so cute. I like it. I just she kisses him and I was like, oh, everything is going to be good. And then we just have this like weird thing later, whatever. Um, and I mean, honestly, guys, she didn't remember anything. You'd think getting her memory back and remembering that Rory waited for 2000 years for her would probably be even more like romantic, right? We haven't seen much of her really dealing with that. Yeah, I guess so. 2000 years. I mean, shit. (sighs) Anyway. All right. Um, so the doctor is figuring out why the hell this, uh, Dalek turned back on again. And he thinks that it must have been like the restorative light from the Pandorica hitting it. And Mm -hmm. as he says that the Dalek begins to move again and they all flee. Uh, and thus begins the sequence of... Fez time traveling Mm -hmm. with the mop for some reason. And then we have the finding of the doctor's body on the stairs. And he is dead. So the doctor says. But River later is like, well, the doctor lies. Mm -hmm. Did we really know that? Have we seen him lie before? He doesn't tell the whole truth I, about we've things sometimes. Seen that sure, yeah. Because she just says I it think in, that, in a way like that's like kind of his brand is that he lies, and I was like, I never really thought of him that way. It's interesting. I'm not like mad about it. I feel like a big main character who lies is honestly more interesting than otherwise usually, but. I just didn't he tells really people see what that. they need to know in the moment so they do what 
he needs them to do. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't okay. tell, he doesn't explain everything fully so that they know the whole story. True. Or they know okay. the whole plan. Yeah. So, like, he comes down these stairs and he's dying and he tells himself something and all that then dies, supposedly. And then a live doctor is like, he's dead. Right. And we just have to take that at face value, even though we know as an audience, he's not dead. I mean, he can't die like this. He could. The Daleks can kill him. He's not, like, he would maybe regenerate. I guess it depends on how he, maybe Daleks are one of the things that can kill a Time Lord. I guess that's my main question, because I just sort of was like, we know he can, like, I didn't know, I guess, whether Amy knows about the regeneration thing. Is she aware um, I think, that that's, like, possible for him? I think what she knows is she met him while he was newly regenerated. So okay. you would think that at some point he explained that to her. Like, why he was acting the way he did when he met her when she, he was, or when she was seven. Right. Like, why he was eating weird food. <laughs> he was regenerating. Uh, I forgot about those fish sticks and custard. Is that what it was? Fish fingers and custard. Gross. Um, yeah, I... Okay, so this was another thing that, um, for me, I don't know what I was supposed to feel or what other people felt, but it was a weird thing for me when he pops up dead and we have this whole thing about, like, oh, he, he... you know, in 12 minutes, he'll die. I mean, we know he's not going to die. Right. But it feels like so much service is paid to the idea of, of like, being worried that this is what's going to happen. Even though it's just so assumed, I thought, of course, he's going to be fine. So it, there, it just felt like there was a lot of energy in the script put towards something that was a foregone conclusion to me. It was not even a risk. So there was no tension there. But I feel like they wanted there to be tension. Yeah. And the same you know goes with... Yes. The same goes with his like little travel back through his own timeline and his experiences with Amy. Mm-hmm. As if the TARDIS is going to explode and he's going to die on it. Yeah. As an audience member, even when this first aired, I was like, well, he's not going to. Yeah. Because I, I, just I know there's like... another season. Like, I know that there's... It's hard for me to feel the jeopardy involved with a character who I know isn't going to die because he's the main character on a show that's named after him. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm it's mm-hmm. like... On Grey's Anatomy, when something terrible happens to Meredith, I'm never really worried that Meredith is going to die. Because it's called Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. Okay. I worry about any other characters on the show because they can and have and, you know, lots of people have died on that show. But Meredith, I'm never all that worried. Yeah. Because it's her show. So, yeah. Like, I get it as a a storytelling device, but it's hard to get emotionally invested when, like when I knew David Tennant was leaving Mm -hmm. and was going to be regenerating. Then I felt something because I knew he was leaving. The doctor was going to change, but I never felt like, Oh, the doctor's going to die. Yeah. I just, uh, I feel like I don't know why they keep trying to make that happen. Uh, I think it's just a common plot device. It doesn't work, though. And it, like, kind of has never worked. Right. It's weird to me that they keep attempting to force a tension that inherently can't exist. Especially... Or it's... Or or it's it's to... Because we're going to feel what... Maybe we're supposed to feel what the characters are feeling. 
or but we can't. Right, but we can't. Exactly. Like I know that Rory and Amy and River were sitting there all sad because the doctor's going to die and we're all going to die if that doesn't work. But even if it does work, the doctor is going to die. And I'm like, eh, he's he'll be fine. Yeah, you know. You like- guys are very, very upset, but we all know. Like, they should do these types of things with characters that aren't the doctor. And then you would be more scared and more mm-hmm. emotionally invested. Yeah, I just don't like it. Just the, I feel like they keep kind of going back to this well of like, oh, aren't you so sad? And I know that I'm not the only one who has to know for certain. I don't need to be sad. It's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. I'm not the only one who feels that way. So is there anybody for whom this really works? Is there anybody for whom this is like a genuine like nail biting sort of moment of moment of like great emotion? Kids, I feel like sort of maybe kids, I guess. I feel like that's a real cop out, though. I don't even know that I buy that kids would really like fall for this. Maybe they would. It's not like kids understand, like, how the business goes. They're not reading, like, oh, the, you know, season six has been commissioned or whatever. Season six is a solid go. So whatever happens in this episode, I'm not worried. If a kid is watching this, they might think, like, well, the doctor could die. The doctor could regenerate. We don't know what's going to happen here. Hmm. And it's a show that was traditionally for families and for children, so maybe. That's the only thing I can think of for them to keep going to this well. Yeah. You would think that they would come up with a different way of getting that sort of emotional investment, though. Yeah, you know, like, I could have felt this way for River Mm -hmm. very much. Now... That may seem weird considering that River is in a bunch of episodes where, like, she has jumped around in time enough that the Doctor has gotten to know her better. So you could say, like, well, you know that because of that, she will be fine. But enough of history has sort of collapsed in this episode that I wouldn't be totally confident of that. It wouldn't feel like such insurance to me the way that it does. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if we had put her in peril and she's a really good character, I mean, even having Amy shot, I was pretty much positive Amy was going to wind up being fine. But I, I could have been maybe convinced. I don't know. Maybe not even then. Maybe not even Amy. Rory... I just refused flat out to buy that one because I just wasn't going to have it. We will not have it. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's the, maybe the show has just given itself too many outs for this to ever really work. Do they have to just start killing people? Is that what maybe. we have to do? Might be. It's time for the show to grow up a little bit and start killing some people. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. Like, I don't, you know, I don't really want to, I don't want to be the person who tells a show to grow up and kill people. (laughs) I don't (laughs) like it. But I think that I get to do that here because they are depending so much on the potential death of characters for drama. Yeah. You know, you can't keep doing that if you have never followed through on it. The only characters who who's a major character that died that like we cared about on this show. Yeah, there's not really anybody, is there? None. Mm-mm. Even a, a pretty significant side character has never died. They've always wound up just being like put somewhere and left, but we know they're yep. fine. Yeah, yeah. No, no characters that aren't. Only in the episode for the one episode have died. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's what we need to do. We need to start fucking dealing out some real consequences. Or else this is an unsustainable model. What do you think? 
Well, considering there's 11 seasons of this Doctor Who reboot, I would say it's possible that some people die, but it's possible that they've managed to make it a sustainable model. Well, I mean, sustainable model in that people will still continue to watch it because people love it. But I'm talking about sustainable model in that the tension actually works. Oh, yeah. I I mean, I can't really say. Not allowed to say one way or the other. I'm trying to... There was another show that kind of... Oh, you know what was one that was real bad? Was, of course, my constant go-to example for bad television. The Walking Dead. Mm Mm-hmm. In which they constantly pulled characters out of trouble, but faked us out that they were dead to the point where people were actually dead, but nobody bought it because. Well, they didn't always do like, that. I'm in, in no way defending that show. That show's fucking garbage, but they didn't always do that. They started doing that with fucking Glenn. Oh, and that's man, really when I should have quit. I should have quit. I was so shocked by that happening. And when it turned out he wasn't dead, I should have fucking quit because I was, I very rarely been so angry at a show for manipulating me the way it did. And then they didn't even have the balls to go through with killing Rick. We knew the actor was leaving the show. (laughs) Spoilers for walking dead, by the way, who fucking cares? They fucking like, doesn't he like fly away on a helicopter or something? He's like, he's like chased down by zombies. They think he's been attacked and, yeah, a helicopter comes and picks him up and flies him away, and nobody knows that that happened. And then they, like, spend all this time searching for him and then decide that he must have died, but they've never found his body. With the indication that, well, I guess Rick could show back up someday. And I was furious. What a like, I was already like, why am I still watching this show? And then they couldn't even kill him. He's the worst. And then they killed all the good characters. And I was like, I'm fucking done. <laughs> to hear in real time my growing rage at that show, you can listen to uh, <laughs> The Unspoiled Walking Dead, which I started off covering by myself while I was still married. And mm-hmm. then continued to cover with Owen, who was amused by how bad the show was, whereas I just got more and more angry. And then eventually I was like, I'm not doing this is it. I'm done. Yeah, we're, oh, we're done. And uh, he still laments at times that we <laughs> don't cover it anymore. No, but- I've heard some stuff about the most recent season. And I'm like, thank God I finally mm-hmm. quit that show. I just I just can't. That show's been on for too long, and they just it's just the same plot over and over again. Yep. Like, at least with Doctor Who, like, yeah, there are repetitive things, and there are things, like, it's hard to be upset because I know the Doctor's not going to die, mm-hmm. but the plots are always different. Mm-hmm. At least they do that. The Walking Dead is literally the same plot over and over and over again. Just with different characters. Yeah. And it's boring. I'm just like... I said that about some other show, too, that it was basically the same thing every year, just with new characters involved. And I can't think of what it was, but it's it's boring. I, there's a lot of shows like that that are just super formulaic and predictable and whatever. And, like, you know, depending on the show, that's not always a terrible sin. There are going to be shows that you go to it because you want the same thing that you've gotten a million other times because it's comforting. And you come Mm -hmm. to this show not for the thrills, but because it's like putting on your comfy old PJs. Yeah. And that's fine. And I get the sense that's probably what this show is for a lot of people. Um. But it, yeah, with like something like The Walking Dead, where it's just basically over and over every season, what if men were the real monsters? <laughs> I remember what I was thinking of was Silicon Valley. Did you ever watch oh, I that? I saw it. Mm-mm. It's really funny, but I quit after like four seasons because I realized it's the same thing every year. Hmm. Just. A slightly new, oh, we really need to get our app made 
and we but we need the money we don't have the money oh we got the money oh we're getting fucked over and oh we lost it now we have to start all over again every year that's the the plot every year we have to make this thing we got somebody to invest in it oh we fucked everything up oh we lost it now we have to start over and it's Mm. boring it stopped being funny i think people see things that work and especially when they have a really good cast they want to keep going the shows are successful the walking dead is a very successful show amc Mm -hmm. does not want to get rid of it but there's not a story there anymore yeah yep anyway okay we're like halfway through this episode we gotta (laughs) get going here um all right so we kind of talked about him dying we have him saving river who's like stuck in a uh loop she's yeah she's stuck in a time loop which uh i thought was actually a pretty neat idea i liked that um so you keep hearing her say i'm sorry my love over and over again Mm -hmm. there comes a weird moment at the end when he asks her if she's married and she says yes in this way that makes him go no 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 are you saying that you're married or are you saying yes to me because I'm not at, and she just keeps saying yes mm-hmm. and I found that very amusing um, do you think that she's married to him I mean because because Amy asked her that early right. on when she first met her too mm-hmm. it's the kind of thing that there's no other real like read on it other than maybe she's the doctor's mother which i don't think is the thing because she's too flirtatious with it yeah she's she keeps like kissing him and stuff (laughs) yeah you know it's there's a real sexy (laughs) undertone to it all so i don't think that's what it is but if it's not i have no idea what else it can be and i don't see the doctor getting married I just don't see it. Maybe? There was a very big question that we all had about River, especially after this episode. But I think Mm -hmm. pretty much since she first appeared, because, you know, she made it clear that she has a history with the doctor. She's got this whole journal full of their escapades. But she doesn't want to tell him because she's meeting him. This is the first time he's met her and she knows him. Right. So there was the question of what does she mean to him? But then when she comes back in this season and it's even more of like, mm-hmm. wait a minute. What is the deal with River and the doctor? Are they married? So that was a big question for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand like wanting to know. I understand that being the theory. It feels like that can't be it because it's been projected so much. Right. It feels like a red herring. But at the same time, there's no other explanation that I feel like I'm really going to believe because of the tone of it every time, you know? Or it's just that they have this flirty relationship or they have a relationship yeah yeah and they just know each other very very well Hmm. and have you know probably had some weird alien sex i don't know (laughs) how many slash fix are there of the doctor with various aliens i don't know i'm sure a lot i've never dove into the doctor who fanfic world there there has to be like there must i mean with that tree woman alone (laughs) that was a real setup of just like the doctor fucks um (laughs) i just i'm curious about it now that i think about it i'm sure it exists and i'm sure there's some really disturbing stuff out there like the doctor with daleks and all kinds of weird shit i'm not interested in any of that i was reading an interesting thing today about how authors can't read fan fiction like of their own work because because they the might subconsciously sued. yeah yeah which yeah. is kind of wild for those who 
did not follow what we just said because we didn't explain it at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that basically they can read something, kind of absorb an idea without in, like intending to steal it. And mm-hmm. then use that idea in a future work without realizing that they picked it up from somebody else's fan fiction. And that fanfic writer can sue them for stealing their intellectual property. And uh, apparently this is something that like either has happened or came close to happening. Um, like the lawsuit part. And mm-hmm. I just, you know, it makes a ton of sense. You just absorb ideas. I have that all the time with like jokes and stuff that I'll like say a joke and then I'll sort of be like, I don't feel like that's mine, but I don't know where I got that from, (laughs) you know? Um, And you just kind of have to cordon yourself off from any, and it was posted actually on uh, Twitter by NK Jemison, who's the writer of broken earth because people kept sending her a fanfic of her stuff. And she had to be like, guys, you have to stop doing this because I don't want to squash your uh, like enthusiasm and tell you not to write it. But I have to if you send it to me because my work is copyrighted. So I have to make a show of telling you to defend myself and I can't read it. So you're going to get upset that I just basically re- like returned you putting work into this thing with don't do that and also no I won't read it and I have to do that because it's my job and my livelihood but you're just going to be mad and I don't want to be this guy but you're putting me in this shitty position so anyway I'm wondering about the fanfics with River is what I'm saying um I'm not sure I'm sure there's lots yeah um what I find interesting about that whole thing is that there are people who wrote fanfic who then changed a little bit of it and made actual books Mm -hmm. that got Mm -hmm. published. Mm -hmm. So Fifty Shades is a very famous one. Mm -hmm. It started out as Twilight fanfic. She changed it to Two Humans, made it all BDSM, and made a billion dollars off of it. Right. I just don't understand how that's... a allowed yeah and the same goes for um those i think it's a city of bones series that girl started her stuff by writing harry potter fanfic that she then changed it was like if i'm remembering correctly because it was a big brouhaha on live journal back in the day um it was harry draco slash fic (laughs) <laughs> that she then turned into, that, created a world based off of this fanfic she'd written and then just changed enough details that it no longer was noticeably Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, if that's the key, right? If you change enough detail, every character ever written is a version of a character that has been seen somewhere else. And what's just sort of the thing is, like, you can know that it started off as this fanfic, but if they change the names, there's no association anymore. Yeah. Whether or not that was how it began, it doesn't remain. So I guess. Yeah, I I guess it has to be very obvious. And with writing, it would have to just be straight up plagiarism, I imagine. Yeah. Unlike music, where there was a really, I think it was the first big lawsuit where George Harrison wrote a song that he released, and this other group, like a Motown group or something, was like, that's our song. And it was proven in court that the music part of it was just too similar, like almost Mm -hmm. note for note from the original song. And so all of the Like, he had to split the money he makes. Well, he's dead now. But the royalties of that song, of My Sweet Lord, now also is shared with this other artist who wrote Mm. the song before him. Yeah, I I had this, like, I saw in the comments on that thing with N.K. Jemisin, somebody saying that, like, writing fanfic is harder because you are working in somebody else's universe. But I cannot say that I agree with that. 
Because to me, creating original characters is by far the hardest part of writing. And yeah, if you've got that already done for you, that's 80% of the work done. Yeah. Um, so I did not buy that whole because this dude was trying to be like, actually, you know, it's it's way more difficult. Yeah. All right, buddy. Sure. Oh, was it a dude? Uh-huh. 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 uh-huh Shocking. Uh-huh. Surprising <laughs> that it would be a dude that would be like, actually, <laughs> me playing in your world is really limiting on me. Listen, Jamie, I don't want this to turn into the Man Bash cast where guys feel bad listening to my show about being guys after. No, actually, that's fine. Feel bad about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Not sorry. <laughs> Hashtag not sorry. Um, all right. So, yeah, he saves her. Um, it's pretty fun with her looking at him just like, oh, really? Took you fucking long enough. Um, and she is, uh, at first when she sees Rory, she just calls him the plastic centurion mm-hmm. and then says, I dated a nesting duplicate once. Swappable head did keep things fresh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not saying I love this idea, <laughs> but I don't hate it. <laughs> I mean, even for myself, if I could have a swappable head, I'd be pretty into that. How much fun would it be to just be able to be somebody else real easy? Yeah. Like, if you're going somewhere that you know looking like a certain type is going to be highly advantageous to you, and being able to just put that type on for the day doesn't suck, that could be helpful. It would be amazing, though, if you could swap out your head for a different race, but your hands wouldn't match. So you'd have to, like, yeah. wear gloves. Just kind of hope yeah. nobody noticed, I guess. <laughs> um, but, yeah. They then all sort of, like, get on the doctor for the fact that he's wearing a fez. Yeah. I like that he says, I wear fezes now. There is something about people making declarative statements about things that they do now <laughs> that fucking never fails to crack me up. Like, they've just decided that this is the, their identity. This is what it is now. And what it My shall friend be. Bob, when I met him, would only wear green. He wore all shades of green, but only green. That's all he wore. All his clothes okay. were some shade of green, including his shoes. Now he only dresses in vintage clothing. Oh, no. He wants to dress like Cary Grant, and he buys all vintage clothing. And that started, like... Before I left Arizona, so probably in like 2001, and it has lasted. So I guess this is a trend for him that is not really a phase. It's just become part of who he is. But he was like that. Like, this is the thing I'm doing. It's this is this is part of who I am. I only wear green. But I only it's wear not vintage. Part of who he is because it's over now. <laughs> Well, the green is, but the vintage clothing is carrying on. Does he have a mustache? No. Okay. That's something. No. And he can get away with it because he's extremely funny and charismatic and has all these other qualities that you're like, of course you do. Of course you only wear vintage clothing. I would think no less of you. Of course. He is the only person who has made me pee my pants from laughing. <laughs> it's he's very proud of that still. So I yeah. just don't he, like I I understand doing a thing over and over because you like it. Of course. I understand having a certain style because you like it. But I don't understand announcing it as like an identity. Well, that's true. He didn't do that. Just just it popped in my head like i do know someone who has a particular thing that they just decided they were gonna do from now on yeah like i thought about changing my entire wardrobe to only wearing black Mm -hmm. and how exciting it would be to like how would i get variety in there if it's just if i'm only wearing black and then it became exhausting just to think about like i'd have to get all new clothes Mm -hmm. it's too much 
Yeah, because like, you know, I wear a ton of really bright colors. I like to get as many of my accessories in pink as possible. But that's purely because I just love pink so much. And it just makes me mm-hmm. really happy to look at it. And I never had a moment in my life where I was like, oh, yeah, this is what I do now. I Everything is pink. That's my thing. It just, <laughs> I just like pink. And that was just a thing that I naturally did. So this sort of the, like, oh, I wear fezes now. I've met people who have, like, decided that this quirky, like, I have a uh, watch on a chain. I don't wear a wristwatch. I have a pocket watch now. That's my thing. <laughs> don't do yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> just be, just be who you are. And if who you are is somebody with a pocket watch, Fine. But you don't need to re, like, change who you are seen as, as a person. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe people feel like I can't start doing this weird thing out of nowhere because people will laugh at me. So I have to justify it somehow. Maybe. By saying like, oh, this is my thing now. Instead of just doing it. And that comes down to lacking courage, I guess. And being too afraid of, like, the pushback for doing Mm. something that you like. So then you feel the need to, like, declare, this is what I do now, to sort of, like, head off everyone else's comments about it. I guess? Does that make sense? I've never known anybody who's just been like, okay, I wear these fake glasses now. I know I don't need them, but I'm wearing them now. Mm. Like I don't, I don't know anybody who's just picked a one thing, and then like this is the thing I do. No lucky. <laughs> There's no good response to somebody doing something like that because it just feels inherently sort of silly. I mean, I've had, I've known people that have done, have made personal choices, but they've never announced it. Like, this is the, I've decided I want to wear glasses, but I don't need glasses. Or I want to carry a pocket watch. Or I'm only going to have a wallet on a chain or whatever. I'm only going to wear tap shoes. I don't know. I've never known anybody who's like. I'm only going to wear tap shoes. (laughs) Let's try to think of something weird. Friendship over. (laughs) Fuck. Walking around (laughs) with tap shoes. Ugh. God, that is just, oh, I'm so irritated by that just in thought. Anyway. (laughs) All right. um, This is probably the most tangential episode we've ever done. Tangential. (laughs) There's a fight with a Dalek. Uh, She finds out that the doctor is killed and, like, kind of goes hard on this Dalek. Because she thinks the doctor is going to be killed by it, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's a weird scene of, again, her ra- raging against a machine in a way that <laughs> I don't buy because we know the doctor can't really die. And I really thought she would also know that this was unlikely. But mm. I guess you said that the Daleks can kill the doctor, you think? I don't know. I think that River is just shown here to be a lot more, a lot less merciful. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to learn about her here is the doctor, you know, the Dalek says, you know, I look in, in my database and the doctor will show, the doctor shows mercy. You're an associate of the doctor. So you will show mercy. And she's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. check again. It's like to show us that she's pretty ruthless and The doctor does show mercy often, even to his enemies, and he has to the Daleks. I love it. But but she's like, fuck it, I don't care. Say it again. Say it again. One more time. It keeps saying mercy. I don't know why. Why does she want him to say it again? He wants, she want him to beg? Yeah. Is that all it is? Yeah, I think so. Um. So, yeah, like, I do like it for her character building, but it was just a moment again of just, like, she's mad about a thing that I'm pretty sure she should know isn't what happened. But it's fine. We go back. His body is gone. Uh, 
and there is just a what is that a duffel bag on the floor what is it that he has left there's something sitting the du- there where his body was isn't it just a jacket that Rory put over him is that what it is yeah okay thank you I see it sitting there and I was just like I don't remember this part but they go down to the box and the doctor that they thought was dead uh, is now in the box. Mm-hmm. And it turns out the other doctor had lied. As long as the Dalek was chasing us, he could work down here, um, is what River says. And honestly, she's in there with the doctor in this Pandorica. And I was like waiting for it to like close on them. I thought mm-hmm. for sure that this was all going to be like a trap again. Uh, especially when stuff starts to like get weird because things are collapsing still. And I thought this was going to lead to him getting trapped yet again. Um, but she's like trying to wake him up and he explains to her that he was trying to do big bang too. And she realizes that if they can use the Pandorica to project the uh, TARDIS exploding the, the light Pandorica, from it? The Pandorica has a, the light inside of it is restorative. That's how that mm-hmm. Dalek came alive again. Right. So his theory is if he can fly the Pandorica directly into the exploding TARDIS which is what's causing the universe to collapse mm-hmm. instead it's going to project out this restorative light from inside the Pandorica and that will reboot the universe. Okay. Instead of the TARDIS making the universe disappear. I guess that makes sense. That works. It makes as much sense as any other sci-fi on this show. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much where I fall on it. Is that, and you it's, know, it's ridiculous, it's, but it's no more ridiculous. Right. And it's at stuff. least it's at least better explained than a lot of the stuff we've seen in these big events. That's true. And it's like predicated on something that happened already with Amy's memory and stuff. Uh, yeah. Being, you know copied and used for things so that's the main thing is as long as it's consistent within the storyline i can deal with it Mm -hmm. it's when things sort of seem to not make sense because just yesterday we did a different thing but now we found out oh actually that only worked because such and such but we can't do it again or that worked because such and such but this uh makes that no longer functional or whatever. That's when I start to be like, all right, you're just making whatever you want happen whenever you feel like it. Right. This isn't um, like the Pandorica didn't suddenly become a deus ex machina. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's established in this episode that that light does something. And right. they take that idea and apply it to something else. And maybe this will work. He doesn't know right. if it will. But he's hoping that it will. So... Then we get the doctor having to sacrifice himself in order to steer the TARDIS into the Pandorica light, right? Well, he's he's got How that vortex going? manipulator on and he's wired himself into the Pandorica. So or he's wired the Pandorica into the vortex manipulator or something so that when he uses it to get to the TARDIS, mm-hmm. it goes with him. And then okay. once he joins the TARDIS with this Pandorica, while this it's exploding, that's what should cause the universe to reboot. Okay. But he thinks he's going to die in the process. Right. So then we get this like flashback to a bunch of different places that he was and looking at the crack. Um, and I feel like we pretty much talked about this and the fact that it was just like, this big thing but we knew that he was going to be okay so I wasn't that worried about it Um, he eventually gets back to Amy asleep on her suitcase in the most precious sad moment ever 
Mm-hmm. And he had talked to Amy right before he like went about her parents and asked her, hey, do you know what happened to them? And she couldn't remember. And she started to kind of freak out. And he was like, yeah, see, th- that is not your it's not your fault. You don't remember because they just sort of disappeared from your life. Because yeah. what she always says is she lost her parents, which makes it sound like they died. But when right. you really press, there's no and there's nothing behind that. Um, and he is sitting next to her bed saying, I thought if you could hear me, I could hang on somehow. Silly old me. Um, but we find out that she is asleep, but she does sort of hear him. And yeah, he tells her this whole story about how he stole or borrowed the TARDIS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I and I like did we I like how this. I knew that he stole it. Okay, I wasn't sure if that um, was something that like was from a previous season, like before I when don't he started. No, if I learned that from this episode, or if I learned it in an earlier one, if he mentioned it in an earlier one or not. Mm-hmm. I think I think it was mentioned at some point earlier but i like how he tells her this story and it's called back in a really cute actually cute way with that wedding saying of something old something new something borrowed something blue yeah i thought that was well done because it's not obvious when he says he stole this target tardis well i borrowed it i intended on bringing it back it's ancient and new and it's the bluest blue ever. Mm-hmm. I just think, like, I I don't know why I love the TARDIS as much as I do. I just do. I love it. And so hearing it described in this way, it just made me all warm. Like, it is. It's so blue. I love the TARDIS. So I just thought he was, like, telling a nice little story. And then when it comes back later, I was like, oh, that's clever. That's clever yeah. writing. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, so we have her waking up on her wedding day, and her mother comes in to give her tea, and she's very startled at the fact that this is her mother, and then immediately wants to know why she's so startled. And she has the same reaction when she sees her father, who really does look like a Harry Potter character. (laughs) Um, And she keeps having these moments of, like, shock, and then being like, why am I so surprised? And then we go to the wedding uh, and she is, she sees River walk by the window Mm -hmm. and it sends her into a moment of like real shock is the best way to describe it. I think her acting in that moment is excellent of being like really just shaken, so badly shaken and not knowing or understanding what just happened yeah um and she does the thing where she's crying and she doesn't know why uh rory says that this woman dropped off this book for you and it she opens it and it's the journal but there's nothing written in it and she stands up and is like there is somebody really important missing And talks about her imaginary friend and everybody is like, oh, not this again. Come on. But then she says that she remembers him. I found you. So you better get your ass to my fucking wedding, buddy. And then, sure enough, the TARDIS appears in the middle of the dance floor. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he turns up, Rory also remembers Yep. Which I appreciated because I kind of wondered if Rory was going to have to go through this again. I was just being like, what's happening? Who is this? What is going on? And I was like, so relieved that his re- reaction is, how could we forget the doctor? I was plastic. He was the stripper at my stand. <laughs> <laughs> Not helping the situation to talk like that, Rory, but okay. <laughs> um, and again... Another reason that I feel a little bit bad for Rory is that the doctor is wearing a better outfit. Mm. He's got this tux with the white bow tie and the scarf and a top hat and tails. And I mean, look, Rory looks adorable. 
but that's definitely a rented outfit. And <laughs> what the doctor is wearing, he looks like he's about to go to the opera or something in 1920. Yeah. You know, it's a good time. Um, so, yeah, then she does that. You absolutely definitely may kiss the bride and starts to approach him with the air of a woman who is going to hike up her dress and mount him in the middle of the fucking dance floor. And for a minute, I was just like, girl, what are you doing? But then this keeps happening. Um, shakes Rory's hand, Mr. Pond. I really like that we get a bit of a montage of the rest of the wedding. Mm-hmm. And there's no recognizable music playing. But it all sounds like music you kind of think you might have heard somewhere. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because they're not, they don't want to pay for music that they need to license. But they're playing stuff that's like, I, I, is that, do I know that? It's like close enough, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was just fun to see this wedding, to see a happy thing. It's a nice, uh, happy, and his fucking weird thriller esque dance moves. I love it. I've looked for gifts of that dance before because They're I think it's there? so funny. I couldn't find it. I I didn't look hard. I was trying to react to something and I, everything I put in was not bringing that up. So I'm sure there's some out there. Um, there's a moment where he's doing one of his dances and Amy is laughing. Mm-hmm. And apparently that was Karen's real reaction to <laughs> Matt's dancing. Aww. Well, it deserved it. Yeah. Um, that so that arms up t- like a giraffe dance, I think, is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, he goes out to the TARDIS. River is there. He gives her the book back, which he did not look through. I guess it was blank. But was it blank? Um, I think that they did something to it so that Amy wouldn't be able to read it. And now that Amy has remembered, everything came back to it. Okay. Huh. Um, okay. Just some magic. I don't know. But he right. says, all your, all your writing is back. I didn't read it. And she says, spoilers. Yeah. Um, And he asks her who she is and she says, you're going to find out very soon now. And I'm sorry, but that's when everything changes. And then she presses a button on her little dealie and disappears. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it feels like ominous. But I guess we'll see. He dances on into the TARDIS. Amy follows him. And... Rory also follows eventually. She says, it's my wedding. He says, our wedding. And the doctor says, it's time for goodbyes. And she's like, do you think that uh, that's true? Is it time for goodbye? And they're like, yeah, I think so. And then they stick their heads out the TARDIS and they're like, goodbye. And then they go off again. Mm-hmm. And he tells uh, your majesty we're on the way, which there's some goddess on a ra- train station. What was it? There's an Egyptian goddess on the loose on the Orient Express in space. Right. As will happen. There's also something um, he says... Something about how he doesn't know what led the TARDIS to the date on the temporal explo- of the temporal explosion. Hmm. Okay. Um, and he hasn't figured out the meaning of the silence will fall. Ah. Okay. And that's when his phone rings. Oh. All of a sudden, I was like in the middle of watching this and all of a sudden I got video unavailable. We're experiencing a problem playing this video. Well, huh. good timing, Amazon. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they uh, they go off to the Orient Express in space. Sounds pretty good. I'm interested. I'm hoping there's a murder on it and that we meet Poirot. A fictional <laughs> character, granted, but nevertheless, I would like it. Uh, 
And that's about it in terms of my predictions. <laughs> well, the next episode is the Christmas special from this year. Oh, okay. So, And then we'll get into season six. That'll be fun. I always like the Christmas specials. Cool. Yeah. So that will be considered part of season six on Amazon, I guess, because this was the finale. Uh, it, no, I, I would check and see. I think it's attached to season five. Do I have to buy season six? I do, huh? This is really annoying because I was hoping by the time we got through with season five, HBO Max would have launched, but it's still not coming out until the 27th. And that's what Doctor Who is going to be on. The 27th of April? May. 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 Oh, oh. Yeah. Boom. Unfortunately. Um, but let me look at it because it, if it's not too – are you going to – do you have HBO Go? Not HBO Go. Do you have HBO Now? Yes. Okay. So well, that will switch right over – to HBO I Max. Information. Ah, well, I was going to share mine with you if you didn't have it because I have hey. HBO now. Um, so let me look at how much, how many episodes we may need to cover between now and when that launches and how much that would cost because it's probably less than buying the whole season. So what's the name of the next episode, the Christmas special one? I believe it's called The Christmas Carol. Huh. I hate telling you okay. that. Well, I mean, I'm going to see it, but I'm just trying to find it on here because it just says the Big Bang. And then when I went to season six, it said Impossible Astronaut. Yeah, that's so the I'm first episode of season it. six. Uh, are all the Christmas normal- specials listed? Oh, God, I hate Amazon sometimes. I think at some point they grouped yeah, the I'm Christmas specials together. Christmas specials. Yep. Uh, a Christmas Carol. Okay, I've got it. Buy for three dollars. Yeah. You jags. All right. Well, that's done. Okay. Okay. So we have one review. Yay! New review. Um, it's from somebody in the Netherlands, and I don't know that I can pronounce this. Okay. I don't even want to try. Um, Their name is spelled M-O-E-I-L-I-J-K-H-E-I-D. Ooh, fun. Yeah. Superb analysis of each of New Who's episodes. Five stars. Hey. From the Netherlands. I love this premise. One person has seen all the episodes. The other has seen none of it. You can follow along as they go through all the episodes, whether you've seen them or not. It's a pleasure to listen to Jamie and Natasha analyzing each of the episodes and the character developments. Both Natasha and Jamie have valid criticisms regarding some of the episodes that were not so great, which is exactly what I want from a podcast about Doctor Who. Great podcast. And check out Natasha's other podcasts, too. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Sorry that we are ignorant Americans who do not know how to pronounce names. Forgive us. We Normally I would try. <laughs> but, but there are this times one... where, yeah, you're just going to make a fool out of everybody. Uh, yeah, I try. would hate <laughs> to pronounce this wrong. So yeah. I'm just going to refrain. And that's it. There was no decent trivia that I could either share or that was worthy of even talking about other than Karen laughing at Matt. Dancing. <laughs> well, that works for me, though. All right. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it because I have uh, Dresden, so I need to okay. have a break. Thank, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you all are doing all right with everything that's going on. I, it has been a challenge. Um, and it has been less of a challenge for me than for most people. And it's still been a challenge for me. So... I, I really feel for y'all out there and uh, thoughts are with you. Yes. Keep your head up. Keep your hands washed. Don't touch your face. Wear a mask. We'll see you next week. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye.
was an unspoiled network podcast.